happens if General Motors is allowed to go bankrupt, then as the result of that, uh, we're going to let lose the last remaining machine tool, high technology component of the U.S. economy that still exists. And Lynn keyed off of that because he's thinking in terms of real economy, physical economy, not things that are measured in terms of uh, fraudulent statistics, money statistics produced by the federal government. Now, um, this speech by uh, Bill Ford from the Ford Motor Company, uh, on the one hand, was a pretty uh, surprising development because generally speaking, the people who are running the auto industry today uh, are a bunch of insane accountants who have no idea whatsoever uh, how to actually run a modern industry and actually make a profit by actually, you know, improving production. Um, General Motors, back in the 1990s, uh, developed the first fully electric powered car and they actually produced I don't know several thousand prototype copies of the car and leased them out to people all over the country it was a kind of an experiment in you know what promised to be a new generation uh, of automobile designs that would not require any use of any gasoline whatsoever they had put probably a billion dollars into the research and development that went into designing this car. And it was actually pretty good. You could, you know, plug it in overnight uh, to a kind of industrial, you know, electrical outlet, the kind that, you know, most people have in their backyards or their garages. And uh, by the time you got up in the morning to go to work, the car was charged up and could go 200 miles before it had to be recharged again. And um, basically, uh, when the leases expired, people were not allowed to buy these cars. Something like a thousand people around the country were allowed to use these cars on a lease. And when the lease expired, General Motors insisted on gathering all these cars back up again. In fact, um, uh, I know somebody who had a friend who had one of these leases and liked the car so much that he went to a lawyer and had the lawyer go over the leasing contract to see if there was some loophole that would allow him to keep the car. And the lawyer, you know, went over it carefully and he said, forget it, you know, you don't have a leg to stand on. And I guarantee that these people want this car back and they will have you thrown in jail for theft if you don't give it back to them. So General Motors recollected all these cars and made the decision at that point not to go into production. This was like 1991, 1992. You know, they had spent a billion dollars on research and development, and some jackass in their marketing department, probably after getting a bunch of phone calls from the big oil companies, uh, decided to just simply shelve this whole idea and forget about it. And instead, they decided that the big future was in manufacturing these... Um, suburban tanks called SUVs, you know, which are, you know, kill vehicles for enraged suburban <laughs> housewives. <laughs> and, you know, the logic of the company was that you make more of a profit per unit that you manufacture than any smaller cars or anything like that. So General Motors went into a mode of just producing these gigantic SUVs uh, they own Arnold Schwarzenegger's favorite car, the Hummer. Um, and uh, so, not surprisingly, General Motors drove itself to the verge of bankruptcy by essentially losing more and more of the market share in the United States. In the meantime, Toyota and Honda and these other companies went ahead and they didn't develop a fully electric car the way General Motors had done 15 years ago, but they developed these hybrid cars, 
which get 50 or 60 miles a gallon. And uh, today, I just was looking at some statistics earlier today. Um, uh, Toyota produces this Prius, and they projected that they would sell 50,000 of them a year. Then gasoline prices skyrocketed, and now they're running three shifts a day in their, fa in their factories that produce these Priuses. So that they're selling 250,000 of these cars a year. And from the time one of these cars arrives at the automobile dealership, the car lot, to when it's sold is on average six hours. <laughs> the average General Motors SUV sits on the lot waiting to be sold on an average today, these are current statistics, for six months. So, you know, it's this hybrid car that it's electrical slash gasoline. It looks like a station wagon. Yeah, kind of a goofy looking thing, but apparently it, it, it drives fairly well. Anyway, the point is that, you know, on the one hand, you could say that uh, somebody ought to do General Motors a favor and take the entire top management of the company out and shoot them. It would be a mercy killing. Um, but on a much deeper level, what's really at risk now is that if you lose the auto sector, because there's really only now two U.S. auto manufacturers left. One of them is General Motors and one of them is Ford. If those companies go under, it's not like people won't be able to find cars to buy. You know, people will be buying Toyotas, and they'll be buying, you know, Hondas, and they'll be buying Volkswagens. But the point is that what the United States will lose is not just auto plants, but the heart and soul of the auto sector is the machine tool sector. The production of precision machine tools, which are the tools that manufacture the cars. And if that capability is lost in the U.S. economy, uh, then we are absolutely finished as a nation. And this is a reality that Lynn has been hammering at for years, but it's a reality that's now beginning to dawn on certain people. Uh, and, you know, the case of this guy, Bill Ford, is interesting. You know, he is a member of the Ford family that goes back to Henry Ford, who founded the Ford Motor Company back at the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, Ford's idea was, first of all, he was born and raised on a farm. And he hated the idea of spending the rest of his life standing behind some oxen, pushing a plow on some rural farm somewhere in the middle part of the United States. So when he got into industry, uh, his idea was that we're going to come up with innovative ways of mass producing automobiles and tractors. And in fact, the early Model T <coughs> Ford automobile uh, was designed so that you could actually put uh, tractor implements on the front of it. It was a kind of a multi-purpose vehicle, and he designed it so that people could afford these things. You used to be able to buy a Ford Model T at Sears and Roebuck for something like $27. No, I mean, that's, that's a lot different than $27 today. You can't go to McDonald's for $27 today. It was, a, it was a significant amount of money, but it was an affordable amount of money. So the Ford family has a certain sense of pride that they were the pioneers of mass production of automobiles in the United States. And obviously some of that family tradition uh, still percolates through the veins of this guy, Bill Ford. And so uh, what happened with this speech this week in Washington is that this represented a significant political opening, which is why Lynn seized upon it immediately. Because if there are people at the top of the industrial community in the United States who are willing to start thinking in a different way than they've been thinking for the last 30 years, then that's a pretty damn important development. And we want to move on it very fast. So Lynn wrote this letter to Bill Ford, kind of an open letter. Uh, it's going to be published in the newspaper that's going to be printed Monday. But we'll be delivering, a, you know, hand-delivering a copy of the letter to Ford first thing Monday morning. So he'll have it in his hands before the paper's out on the street the next day or so. 
And Lim then wrote this follow-up memo uh, discussing the immediate steps that are going to have to be taken to turn the economy around. And uh, this is a very ambitious set of objectives that Lynn discusses in this memo. But they are not without precedent. And uh, one of the things that Lynn uh, tasked people in the intelligence sector out in Leesburg to work on uh, with the idea that we'll put some initial information out and everybody should, you know, jump on this, uh, is he wanted us to go back and look at some of the precedents that were set during the period of the Roosevelt presidency, the Franklin Roosevelt presidency, during the Great Depression. Because particularly Roosevelt's collaboration with uh, two people, Harry Hopkins and Harold Ickes, uh, was absolutely crucial to turning around the Depression, putting the United States back to work, launching the most unprecedented intensive period of infrastructure development probably in human history. And there's nothing in what Roosevelt and Hopkins and Ickes did in 1933 that can't be replicated today. Some of the situations are different. We have certain aspects of the economic situation in the United States that are more advanced than things were in the 30s. In other respects, the situation is far, far, far worse than it was in 1933 when uh, Franklin Roosevelt came in as president. Uh, for one thing, uh, what Roosevelt inherited was a uh, collapse of the banking system, which occurred with the stock market crash of 1929. Uh, virtually every bank in the country was literally bankrupt. Uh, many of them had their doors shut. Um, unemployment was approximately 50% among uh, eligible you know, workers, people who had previously had jobs. But on the other hand, um, you did not have such a massive shutdown of industry. Factories had been closed, people had been laid off, but those factories were only shut for a few years. And it was relatively easy to go back in there and turn the lights back on and have those factories up and running again. The state of affairs in the U.S. economy today is that we have not just simply turned out the lights in the major industrial you know, heartland of the United States. You know, we've gone in to steel plants and not only shut them down, but we've dynamited the coke ovens. We've actually turned these places into absolute rubble heap, to where there's nothing left. We used to have a massive steel industry in the United States that largely surfaced, serviced the automobile industry, uh, replenishing our rail system, uh, the airplane manufacturing industry, other kinds of modern industries, we used to produce massive amounts of steel, more steel per capita than any other country in the world and probably any country in history. But now, what we're faced with is a situation where uh, in order to kickstart the economy, uh, we don't have factories that we can simply go back to and dust off the cobwebs and turn the power back on and get them up and running with, you know, bringing in new equipment and things like that. Um, we're going to have to go with a massive construction of brand new plants. Uh, we began looking at some of the major projects that are going to be urgently needed to rebuild the U.S. economy. And if you start looking just at one small aspect of that, just take rail mass transit, uh, passenger rail, high-speed passenger rail, and freight rail. Uh, people have seen the animations that the entire rail grid of the United States has collapsed by 70 or 80 percent over the course of the last 30 years or so. 
And if we're going to go back to rebuilding modern high-speed rail, then this is going to require massive amounts of steel. Uh, high-speed rail involves electrification of the rail lines, which means that you're going to have to run power lines, electrical power lines, along the entire length of these rail systems, which means you're going to have to be building enormous numbers of power plants to do this. Now, the good news in all of this is that we don't have to go back to 1950s or 1960s levels of technology. There's a certain advantage to going in and starting from scratch and building brand new plants. Uh, they're called greenfield plants because if you can imagine one day there's just a great big green field, maybe it was a cornfield or something, and the next day you're breaking ground and generally speaking you can have a brand new state-of-the-art modern steel plant or some other kind of major uh, you know industrial plant within about 18 months so and that, that and when, when we got into the war mobilization when Roosevelt said we have to be able to build 500 airplanes a day um, after a period of time because we mobilized not only the physical production <coughs> capacity, but we mobilized the minds of the skilled workers, the machine tool workers. And so all sorts of innovations occurred that vastly improved the productivity. And we were producing, we were cranking out thousands and thousands of airplanes a day once we got the war mobilization going. But none of that would have happened if we hadn't gone through an earlier phase under Roosevelt where working in particular with Harry Hopkins and Harold Ickes, Roosevelt put America back to work in a very very short period of time and the methods that were used were the fundamental principles of the American system of political economy that had been developed going all the way back to the founding fathers and the initial work of our first Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton. The idea was that the federal government under our Constitution has the capacity to issue credits into the economy. And those credits should be issued on a long-term low interest basis for projects that will benefit the general welfare of the entire population. Now, Lynn emphasized in discussions on this today that there's a trick here. We're going to be issuing trillions of dollars in new government credits. Low interest, 1%, 2% at the absolute most credits into the economy and these credits are going to be issued on the basis of a long term 25 to 50 years credits. But these are going to be genuine debts that are going to have to be paid back at the end. And therefore, spend this investment wisely. If you do the wrong thing, not even out of the wrong intent, but if you even just make a mistake and don't figure out how to put together a kind of a national economic design, then you may very well find that you did not achieve enough of a level of wealth production at the end of that period to be able to pay this back. So an enormous amount of thinking and planning has to go into this and therefore it's always valuable to look back historically at an example in relatively recent history in the lifetime, you know, I mean Lynn was alive when all of this was going on. Um, many other people, you know, were alive or at least were sitting around the kitchen table when their parents talked about these things that they lived through. So, what did Roosevelt do? He came into office in March of 1933. And the very, very first thing he did was announce a bank holiday. He literally shut the doors of all of the banks in the country because he knew that they were all bankrupt and that 
he had to protect the household savings of individual households and had to protect the integrity of the banking system even if a lot of the bankers had done some pretty stupid and reckless things to contribute to the collapse of the economy. But Roosevelt was working off of a plan and Roosevelt was working off of the idea that first and foremost he had to defend the general welfare of all Americans. Now there were a number of organizations, government agencies, that were set up under Herbert Hoover that um, were therefore legitimate federal government programs. And Roosevelt said rather than start from scratch and create a whole new set of organizations and have to fight with Congress to get legislation passed and all of this. I'm going to just use the authority of the president and I'm going to slightly alter the way these agencies function. So he took a Hoover institution called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and um, he basically started issuing through this agency large amounts of capital into the economy. And he also began buying up some of the capital of the banks that were bankrupt. So it created an infusion of money into the banking system. About half of the nine and a half billion dollars that he immediately allocated like in his first week as president through this reconstruction finance corporation. About half of it simply went to putting money into the banking system so that the banks could begin performing their functions for their clients, average citizens. When you say capital, what is, the Hamilton mentions it a lot, and I'm kind of confused on what, what specifically capital is. I mean, are you just talking about credit in general? Or? Well, in this case, what they did is, through this Reconstruction Finance Corporation, they generated money which was used in earmarked ways, some of it went into the banks so that the banks were once again liquid and they did it sequentially. They looked at which banks were in fairly good shape, which banks were completely off the wall. They didn't have derivatives back then but they had a lot of other kind of wingdings so there was a differentiation among banks. You had community based banks, some of which were absolutely you know, vital to small communities, farming communities. You'd go to the local banker and you would take out a loan uh, at the beginning of the season and you'd borrow that money and use it to buy seeds, to repair your equipment and then when your crops came to harvest and you sold them and you got money back, uh, you would pay the loans back. And these were generally low interest loans and these were bankers that were born and raised in these towns. So they knew everybody on a first name basis. It was not, you know, like going to a bank where, you know, you hear a computer voice on an ATM machine and that's about the closest relationship you have. These were banks and so in many cases these were banks that were not tied up with Wall Street speculation but served a very vital function in their community. They were prioritized. Money was put into those banks. Some of the banks capital, some of their you know, bonds and things like that were bought by the federal government just to get money flowing into the economy. But then critically, um, Roosevelt knew he had two major tasks. Uh, one immediate task was to put people back to work. And he wasn't all that concerned that many of the people who were out of work did not have significant skills. The idea was get people back to work and so among uh, the first acts of legislation that Roosevelt pushed through in June of 1933 was the National Industrial Recovery Act and what this act said is that we are going to launch a massive effort to rebuild infrastructure in the United States. Uh, waterways, roads, rail, schools, hospitals, everything that you could think of. And in particular, Title II of that act 
what's called the Public Works and Construction Projects uh, title. And um, so in a very short period of time, billions of dollars in credits from the Reconstruction Finance Corporation went into these various projects that were set up under this National Industrial Recovery Act. And one of the first things that uh, was set up was something called the Works Progress Administration, the WPA. This was a project that Harry Hopkins was put in charge of. And um, there was another project called the Civil Works Administration under this. And what Hopkins did is literally the first day on the job with this allocation of money. He didn't even wait to get an office in a federal government office building. He set up a card table in the hallway of some government building and started issuing orders authorizing various projects to be initiated. Now, these projects were basically jointly funded by the federal government and state and local governments. Generally speaking, the federal government put in 85% of the money and the state and local governments put in 15%. But there were provisions if the local governments didn't have any money to afford to do these things that there could be loans made so that these projects would go forward. Now, the idea behind this was to create jobs where people were. One of the terrible things that was happening during the period of the Depression is that um, you know, agricultural production came to a standstill in parts of the country that used to be you know, the grain belt in the Midwest, in areas like Oklahoma, uh, without irrigation, without investment in agriculture. These areas became what were known as the dust bowls, literally, you know, what used to be very good, very fertile farmland literally turned to dust. And people started literally migrating around the country, desperately looking for jobs. You had, you know, people, and these were not foreigners coming into the United States. These were American citizens who simply, you know, could not survive where they were living. So one of the things that had to be stopped was this phenomenon of, internal migration inside the United States. Whole communities were breaking up. So what Hopkins did, he had a very long list of local projects that needed to be done. Projects that were put together by city governments, county governments, state legislatures. The federal government had a whole string of projects that they wanted to get going. And so they started issuing credits and authorizing the hiring of workers to begin building these projects. And these workers were literally hired in their local communities, but working for these federal agencies that had been created to employ people. And under this Civil Works Administration, the rule was that 85% of the money spent was to go to worker salaries. So these were not going to be capital intensive jobs. These were going to be jobs doing things like building roads, building irrigation canals, building schools, hospitals, things like that. And um, in the first week that the Civil Works Administration existed, Harry Hopkins created and put to work 800,000 people in one week. <clears throat> Within a period of nine weeks, four million jobs had been created. And these were not make work jobs. You didn't have, you know, Adam digging a hole and then, you know, Heather coming over with another picket and shovel and, you know, <laughs> refilling the same hole. These were, these were projects that were impressive in the scope of what were being done. In a span of three months from when this project was launched, 40,000 schools began being constructed. 12 million feet of sewage pipe were being laid all over the United States. 
and ultimately a quarter of a million miles of new roads were constructed where no roads had existed. So these were projects that were by and large conducted with the idea of both putting people back to work, but also giving them a certain sense of optimism and giving them a sense of worth that they actually were able to play a productive role in advancing the general welfare of the country as a whole. So, and by the way, this was not done without opposition. Uh, by and large, uh, for those of you who've read uh, Treason in America, you know that going into the Roosevelt presidency, the Democratic Party was a pretty shabby operation and was really dominated by Wall Street. And so there were many in the Democratic Party who considered Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Hopkins and Harold Ickes to be their sworn enemies and they did everything possible to sabotage it. And in fact, after a period of time, um, there were efforts made to declare some of these early FDR programs unconstitutional. And the Civil Works Administration, in fact, was shut down for a period of a year after it had barely gotten started. And um, it was replaced in March of 1936 by the Works Progress Administration, which got through all of the constitutional hurdles and continued to operate. Um, at one point, under the Army Corps of Engineers, they created a, a civilian conservation corps, the CCC, which took particularly young people and put them to work, many of them going out into rural areas, uh, building roads, doing irrigation projects, things like that. Uh, at one point, 2.5 million people, young people, were working in the CCC programs. So one aspect was putting people back to work, putting money in their pockets. Now, for every one job that was created under these government programs, public sector jobs, public works jobs, there were on average 1.8 jobs created, productive jobs in the private sector. Because if you're going to be building schools, using workers employed by the federal government in these various programs. Where are you going to get the steel from? Where are you going to get the brick from? Where are you going to get the cement? All of the elements that go into school construction, and as I said, 40,000 schools broke ground within the you know, initial phase of these programs. Millions and millions of people were put to work through these federal programs but for every 1 million working under a government program, 1.8 million people were productively working in the private sector, working in steel plants, working in automobile plants, you know, working in cement plants, all sorts of things, because to do the kind of scale of construction that was initiated, you had to have a bill of materials. And, you know, Roosevelt was not interested in nationalizing the U.S. economy and turning, you know, every industrial sector of the economy into some kind of, you know, federal agency. Now, so, Harry Hopkins played a pivotal role in this aspect of the program. And the thing that Lynn was really keen on and why he's been emphasizing in recent days the importance of Hopkins is because he's the guy who said, can do, we're not going to wait until I even have an office. Uh, we're going to start issuing on scraps of paper contracts and work orders because we're putting people back to work. And it was done on a massive scale, and it was done overnight. And the same thing could be done now. There's absolutely no impediment to doing this. You know, we could give George W. Bush productive employment. He could make himself feel good, you know, cleaning up the uh, shrubs on his ranch or something. Um, the other aspect of it was interesting, and that was the aspect that was run by uh, another one of Roosevelt's most trusted uh, allies, 
a guy from Illinois named Harold Ickes, I-C-K-E-S, because uh, Ickes was a Republican. The interesting thing is that uh, maybe as much as half of the members of Franklin Roosevelt's cabinet at various times during his presidency were Republicans. You had a very powerful Republican faction that uh, still saw themselves as Abraham Lincoln Republicans. And so among many of these Republicans, the idea of the American system was very deep and very profoundly understood. And Ickes was one of these guys. In fact, he was one of the leaders of the civil rights movement. When the uh, Daughters of the American Revolution refused to allow Marian Anderson to do a concert in the DAR Hall, which is right in Midtown Washington, um, Ickes was the one with Eleanor Roosevelt who organized the concert at the Lincoln Memorial. So this is not what you think of as a Republican by today's standards. This is not a Tom DeLay or Arnold Schwarzenegger Republican. This is somebody who had a certain sense of Lincoln. And so Roosevelt entrusted him with a whole other set of major development projects which uh, were not principally aimed at simply creating jobs in a hurry. Uh, what Ickes was put in charge of were some of the most ambitious high technology infrastructure projects that have ever been undertaken. Things like the Tennessee Valley Authority and the Rural Electrification Administration, which were involved in transforming the entire character of life in major parts of the United States. In most of the South, if you got outside of a major city and lived in a rural agricultural area, chances were pretty good that you didn't have electricity. And so one of the things that Roosevelt did was launched these projects under Harold Ickes. And again, he used the uh, Re Reconstruction Finance Corporation to finance these projects. Um, there were, uh, Ickes was put in charge of what was called the Public Works Administration, which were these big infrastructure projects. And many of the people who had fled from these areas of the country that had been wiped out in the dust bowls in Oklahoma had gone out west. And so you had a labor force out there that was immediately put to work on some of these massive dam projects. There were more levees built, more water management projects uh, built up during this 1930s period than at any time previously in our history. And so what happened is that by the time we got to the late 1930s, and there were a lot of ups and downs in this, as I say, Wall Street hated Roosevelt when they were unable to kill him when he was first being inaugurated, and they were unable to induce a bunch of crazy military guys to launch a coup d'etat to overthrow uh, Roosevelt. They did all sorts of other things uh, to sabotage Roosevelt's forward movement on these programs. But nevertheless, the general march of history during this period was that the United States went through from 1933 to 1939 a period of economic reconstruction which meant that when the war mobilization had to kick in beginning around 1940 we already had factories back open we had people uh, back on the job. We had people who came from very backward and uh, you know limited educational backgrounds, limited job experience, learning significant skills. So that when it came time to actually mobilize for war, um, there were already critical foundations laid. 
And without the New Deal phase, without these job creation programs, without these great projects that were being built from 1933, 34, 35 onward, it would have been absolutely impossible to achieve the additional level of mobilization that we got when we had to bring the country to war. Now, the, another important element of all of this uh, is that the idea of the military in the United States from the days of the Founding Fathers had always centered around the idea of the engineering corps that this was the heart and soul of our military. And uh, so the Army Corps of Engineers was a pivotal agency that Roosevelt used in all of these various New Deal projects. In the 1920s, coming out of World War I, where again we had to go through a dramatic industrial mobilization, uh, there was an institution established within the military uh, called the Industrial College of the Army, which uh, was uh, here in Washington, D.C. Later, after World War II, they brought the other military services in and called it the Industrial College of the Armed Forces. But in the 1930s, among the leading people who were uh, working at this Industrial College of the Army were General Pershing, who had been the great sort of hero of World War I, uh, a guy named General, later General Lucius Clay, who would be the person who actually oversaw the post-war reconstruction in Europe, um, another general named Douglas MacArthur, and another general named Dwight Eisenhower. All of these people were directly involved in industrialization policy through the Army Corps of Engineers. And at a certain point, Lucius Clay, who was the number two man in, in, in the Army Corps of Engineers, was directly assigned to work under Harry Hopkins. So that there was a complete integration of the Army Corps of Engineers and this whole organized engineering battalion concept into the New Deal mobilization. So that all of these things had taken place and were ready to kick in when we had to launch a full-scale industrial revolution to prepare the way for our part in World War II. Um, we didn't have an airplane industry in the United States at the point that Roosevelt sent a message to Congress and said that within a year we have to be producing 500 new airplanes a day. The way that they did that is very simple. They took a prototype of the airplane that they wanted to build and they went out to Detroit and they got a big vacant warehouse floor and they laid out each of these parts on the warehouse floor and they called in all of the top management from Ford Motor, from General Motors, from Studebaker, from American Motors, from all of these companies, all of the machine tool shops that were involved. And again, you had someone like Hopkins or whoever it was sitting on a card table with blank sheets of paper. And uh, so people would walk around the floor and they'd pick up these different parts and you know, the president of the company would have the chief engineer there and they'd have the head of the machine tool shop there and they'd have the head of the, uh, the uh, union if the plant was unionized and they'd walk around the floor and they'd figure out, okay, we can build this part because the factories that we have consist of machine tools and machines and if you give us the raw material, within a few months we can reconfigure the machines and we can make this part. So they didn't wait the 18 months or whatever time it would take to build from scratch a brand new airplane manufacturing company, factory. They took the existing auto plants and they turned them into plants that were manufacturing parts 
for airplanes that were used in the war. They started taking factories that would make tractors and start churning out tanks. Once you've got a skilled workforce and once you've got the proper kind of machine tools, it really doesn't matter all that much what it is exactly that you're producing. You produce what's needed, what's in the general welfare of the country and what the contracts are available to produce. So the entire auto industry was mobilized to overnight retool and become an industry that produced airplanes for the war effort. And within a short period of time, through technological innovations, uh, we were producing three, four, five times the number of planes that Roosevelt initially set out to accomplish, thinking he was setting a very high, almost impossible goal. We surpassed it three or four times over. That's the character of the American system. This is not some crusty academic concept that you read from a book on a dusty shelf. This is how real physical economy works, and it has everything to do with mobilizing the creative potential <coughs> of the labor force at whatever, at whatever level. You're constantly elevating them. And that's the basic principle of physical economy. If you've got a more educated workforce working on more sophisticated and more advanced technology, then you increase productivity by leaps and bounds. And that's the way a modern economy works. You don't outsource to slaves somewhere on the other side of the world and think that that's smart economics. So, now, that's the model. That was what Roosevelt did. Now, where do we stand today in the same process? Um, we're not in very good shape in terms of even some of the most rudimentary things that we used to be able to produce not all that long ago. Um, the steel industry in the United States is gone. What we're producing now are these small recycling plants that take steel and go through. It's a fairly high-tech process, but the volume of steel production in the United States is a fraction of what it was 30 years ago. And it's a uh, fraction of a fraction of the amount of steel that we're going to need to turn the economy around. Because if we're talking about rebuilding our high-speed rail system, uh, this is going to require massive, massive amounts of steel. To have high-speed rail you have to have electrified track and electrified cars, which means that you're going to have to massively increase the amount of energy that's generated in the economy. We're going to have to build a whole new generation of power plants using the most advanced technologies. We're not going to go back and rebuild the 1950s technology coke ovens and things like that to produce steel. We're going to go with the most advanced technologies for steel production. We're going to do all of these things and one of the biggest challenges we're going to face is that because we've been systematically shutting these industries down for the last 30 years, um, we've lost the skilled labor force, particularly the younger generation of skilled labor, to be able to do this kind of work. General Motors today, 50% of the entire labor force of General Motors on the assembly lines, the people producing the cars, 50% of the workers are within two years of being eligible for retirement. In other words, there's not a lot of young workers being brought in through apprenticeship programs and you know going into work in these plants. So we're going to have a big gap that we're going to have to fill because most people, most young people, have never had the experience of living in a productive economy because we stopped having one about 30 years ago. Now, if you start looking at things like magnetic levitation trains, um, these are actually trains which conform more to the character of airplanes. And in fact, most of the construction of the shells 
of these maglev trains are going to be produced in factories that now manufacture airplanes. I mean, you're talking about something that's going to be going 350, 400 miles an hour. You're talking about something that's a hell of a lot closer to an airplane in terms of speed than, you know, your conventional railroad trains today. So we did at one point, not all that long ago, in the 1960s and in the 1970s, uh, the auto industry, as Lynn said in his memo, in his letter to, to Ford, um, he's talking about the auto industry. This industry is not made by automobiles. It, among other things, makes automobiles. It can produce almost anything which we might rely upon the existing auto industry to produce such as a new mass transportation grid, including magnetic levitation grids, crucial elements of urgently needed new power generation installations, essential components required for rebuilding the nation's ruined and depleted water management systems, etc. Back in the 1960s, when we had the Apollo program, when we were putting a man on the moon, the uh, boost, the second phase of the Saturn rocket, which launched the uh, moonshot was made by General Motors. Now, in fact, when you go from producing an automobile to producing uh, a, a second stage Saturn rocket that's going to launch a space capsule into deep space and enable astronauts to land on the moon, you're talking about a level of precision in the production that goes way beyond what goes into making, you know, uh, a Chevrolet Impala. <laughs> you know, I mean, there are such things as lemons when you buy an automobile, especially an American automobile these days. But these same workers, these same plants, were also under the same roof. You know, you have your automobile plant over here, and then maybe you've got another million square feet of floor space in that same factory. And that's an entirely separate division of General Motors called General Motors Aerospace. And under the same roof, you've got workers working on a far, far more precise and far more demanding and, you know, really rigorous kind of level of manufacturing, using some of the most advanced forms of steel production, all of these things. You know, we had a history in this country of doing this stuff. General Motors was the third largest manufacturer of railroad locomotives and railroad cars in the world. And they did a pretty good job of it. But under the tyranny of the insanity of the accounting method and of this idea of globalization and outsourcing and the idea that the United States would become the imperial capital of the world and would no longer manufacture anything because we could steal from colonies all over the planet. Under that change in policy, we lost our ability to produce. So we have a hell of a job on our hands and you can see why it is that when Lynn talks about re Viving the U.S. economy. He, he's talking about projects that will play out over the course of 25 to 50 years. Now, so these are the ideas that um, we've got to bring into the Congress. And, you know, Lynn said very frankly today, he said, look, you know, the, the, the thing I want to do initially is I want the youth movement to immediately get these two documents circulating on Capitol Hill and then, you know, do a certain kind of immersion project, get to really understand these ideas, get to know exactly how we're thinking now about applying the same basic American system of physical economy, of political economy principles to the present crisis situation. It's qualitatively different than anything that we've, you know, dealt with in the past. 
because we've gone so downhill for the past several generations, yet we have advanced industries. Uh, we're on the verge of making breakthroughs in fusion energy. We've got uh, laser machine tool capabilities. We've got a revolution in means by which to produce steel. All of these things are there, but it's going to take a hell of an effort to get from here to there. And the first big thing that we're going to have to break through is the ideology that's dominated for the last 30 years thinking in this country among policymakers and even worse among average citizens. So we're going into a you know, very exciting period. And I think that this uh, speech by Bill Ford, who is you know, not a really heroic guy, I mean, we know a lot of people who know him. They say he's a complete, stiff, boring, really blocked guy. You know, uh, you know, they have a lobbying operation for Ford Motors in Washington, and their chief lobbyist used to be the legislative director at the White House at the beginning of the Bush administration. So they have ways to reach into this government and, you know, push some buttons and, you know, really stir up a ruckus. But they're not likely to do that. That's our job. We've got to force this issue onto the table. And the crisis has reached a point now where a lot of people understand that these kinds of things have to occur. We've brought the Democratic Party from a party of suburban SUVs and kinder, gentler forms of middle class fascism back to a party of Franklin Roosevelt. Now, I mean, the reason the Democratic Party failed to compete with the Republicans in these, you know, enraged suburbs is because the people out there are not kinder or gentler. They don't want a kinder or gentler version of the Republican Party. They want these crooked, mean SOB Republicans because that maps on to their own psychology of total rage. So... The Democratic Party has to forget about that constituency. We'll pick them up on the rebound <laughs> as a byproduct of putting working people, you know, the, the majority of Americans that Roosevelt called the forgotten men and women, putting them back to work, but first mobilizing them as a real political force. We have the Democratic Party now where they're name dropping the name FDR. They're no longer uncomfortable with the idea of referring to themselves as the party of Franklin Roosevelt. But the big challenge, and the challenge for us here, and then the challenge that we've got to put on their plate, is, you know, name dropping is not enough. People have to actually understand the underlying principles of what Roosevelt did. They're identical to what Lincoln did. They're identical to what Franklin and Washington and Hamilton and later John Quincy Adams did. This was the crux of the American system. Situation was different in the 30s than it was in the 1860s. But the principles were the same and they worked. And the same is true now. But scarcely anybody within the political institutions has a clue about what those principles actually are. So we should not delude ourselves that, you know, we, we've got this thing figured out. We've got to launch some real, you know, hard work to make sure that we're as comfortable with these ideas as we are with doubling the square or doubling the cube. We've got to actually have this, you know, deep in our souls. We've got to know how this stuff works so we can actually be innovative and actually teach it to these people in Congress who are going to be wide open. In the meantime, you know, Lynn considers this to be the affirmative mission of the organization and his personal mission to make these ideas clear so people can actually do this. And obviously at the same time, every single day, we're going to do one thing or other to make Dick Cheney's life <laughs> that much more miserable. There's only one way, by the way, that Dick Cheney is going to leave. It's not going to be because Bush tells him to quit. Because Cheney will look at him and spit in his face. You know, he'll say, make me quit. I'm not quitting. And there's no legal way that Bush can fire him. He was elected as legitimately as Bush was. 
as illegitimate as that was. <laughs> There's no provision in the Constitution to fire a vice president. It's going to be a, a nastier political process. What we have to do is make his life miserable. We have to make him a total liability to the Republican Party. We're going to rub every lie he ever told in his face. And I'm just watching that little, uh, <laughs> the 19-minute uh, episode that he staged at the American Enterprise Institute last Monday, you know, I counted about 12 lies just, you know, in the course of that, you know, brief portion of the speech that I heard. We're going to drive this guy into the ground. And ultimately what's going to happen is his wife is going to conclude that for the better interests of her future and her daughter's future, she's going to drag Cheney out by the ears. And that's when he's going to quit. Everybody has somebody they'll listen to. And in the case of Dick Cheney, the only person we've found so far is his wife. So we've just got to make that guy so miserable, such a target of hatred and ridicule, that she throws in the towel. And I figure we ought to be able to do that by February. You know, because there's holidays in the way. It's not going to be quite as fast. But, um, you know, Lynn's really insisting with the boomers and with the phone teams especially that the uh, briefing and particularly the critical flanks that we're going to be hitting on on Cheney day by day be what everybody goes with. You know, he doesn't care if people have a great list of contacts from the American Society of Pink-Haired Ladies or something <laughs> like that. He wants everybody to go with a certain kind of unity of effect because it will shake up the country. But still, that's the negative. You know, we will get rid of Cheney. I'm very <coughs> confident in that. But all that's going to do is clear out a major impediment and hopefully open up some avenues within the executive branch to get these ideas in. But our job is really to put this recovery concept clearly on the table. And we're going to recruit a lot of other people to the effort. We're going to be doing a massive outreach operation, talking to people in these industries, as we've already been doing since the spring of this year when the GM crisis unfolded. The reason that Mark Sweezy brought two busloads of UAW workers in from Columbus, Ohio, is because we started talking to Mark who, you know, was a contact and was already on our network for quite some time. But we started talking to him about things that he really knows about. You know, production at auto facilities. You know, the machine tool principle that, you know, exists in these Delphi plants that he's been working in for, you know, 30 years. When these guys started to see that we weren't a sort of a political side interest, we weren't some, you know, sort of hobby of what they do in their spare time, but that what they represented as a manifestation of these American system ideas was at the heart of our collaboration with them. Everything changed. And they began functioning in a completely different way because suddenly they stopped thinking of themselves as consumers of the intelligence and the policy ideas that we were putting forward and started thinking of themselves as producers, people who were going to produce some of these ideas. These guys know this stuff far better than I do. I mean, how many people here know how many millions of square feet of vacant floor space there is at a Delphi plant in Columbus, Ohio that could be retooled to start making locks and dams for the Mississippi River? These guys know it like that. This is what they do on their job. These are not guys who go in and, you know, do some kind of routine labor over and over and over again for a 12-hour shift or something like that. These are people who are innovative. These plants work on the machine tool principle. You know, some of you were at the, at the dinner after the webcast the other week where one of these uh, auto union presidents responded to Lynn's comments about the suggestion box mm -hmm. and told about his own experience coming up with a new way to make certain tooling for the auto plant. And when they finally did it, sort of on the slide, two or three workers working on this for like a year, uh, they came up with a way of producing a particular part that the company was buying from outside for $530 a part. 
and they could produce it for 50 bucks in-house. And they submitted the blueprints and they had already constructed some prototypes and demonstrated how it worked. And they were given a $20,000 prize by the company. And the company wound up saving a couple of million dollars a year for a long period of time. That's how this stuff worked. You know, American workers do have a certain kind of sense of sovereign curiosity. Some new piece of equipment comes into a plant and it breaks down. They can't wait for that to happen because they're going to take it apart and look at it inside and out and they're going to put it back together and kick it and figure out how to make it work better. There's other cultures. We used to see this all the time when we talked to people in Russia, particularly during the Soviet period. They didn't have this machine tool principle sort of in their souls. So they'd get a new piece of equipment in and they immediately resented it. And the first time it broke down, they would wheel it off into the corner and go back and wheel out the old stuff that they had been working with you know, since their grandparents' generation. There is this certain sense of, of technological pride and sense of sovereignty that Americans have. You know, Winston Churchill, who was not a great friend of the United States, did have certain insights. He said, um, when Americans are backed up in the corner, they'll always do the right thing, but only after everything else has failed. <laughs> and that's kind of the situation that we're in right now. Everything else has failed. <laughs> so we're at one of those, you know, rare moments where people are going to be open to these ideas. So, why don't we, you know, questions, discussion? Uh, you said that um, there were some constitutional um, quarrels that Roosevelt had to go through. I can, and I, I can already foresee some of these discussions that we have because they start to come up. They'll, they'll bring up some of these, these fights Roosevelt was having over the Constitution, and I don't think many of us know that much about it. Well, what, what was the issue? Well, look, you had a whole bunch of people on Wall Street um, who went completely nuts over the idea that Roosevelt was reintroducing the principle of the general welfare. And that Roosevelt was creating federal agencies to create jobs and direct credits into the economy. And so uh, there were people who were arguing uh, that this was overstepping the bounds of the federal government and made, you know, some, you know, generally bogus constitutional arguments. But, uh, and I don't know in great detail, I really haven't looked into the history of the Supreme Court during the Roosevelt period, but uh, considering the fact that uh, prior to Roosevelt, uh, the uh, two presidents before that, Hoover and Coolidge, were both Republicans. Uh, I assume that the situation on the Supreme Court going into the Roosevelt presidency and in the early years wasn't all that great. And In fact, Roosevelt at one point was threatening to what they called pack the court by appointing an expanded number of new Supreme Court justices, and there was a whole big fight over that. It was a sort of a showdown that uh, he instigated to force the court to back down from declaring the entire New Deal unconstitutional. I mean, the, the basic issue that was being argued was states' rights. And that, you know, that basically under the Constitution, um, all authority not specifically given to the federal government was relegated to the states. And so the argument was being made that Roosevelt, in creating these various federal government agencies to create these jobs, uh, was actually uh, interfering in authorities that were really uh, of the state, not the federal government. Now, you know, Roosevelt's argument that trumped that was the same exact argument that Lynn would make. Namely, that uh, the higher principle within the Constitution is the General Welfare Clause and the preamble. And so, therefore, when you're facing a national emergency and you have 50% of your population unemployed and you have people starving, under those kinds of circumstances, the federal government and the executive branch especially has extraordinary power 
to intercede to defend the general welfare. So uh, this was, you know, at least one of the core issues. Um, you know, Roosevelt also had to deal with the fact that, uh, you know, the national chairman of the Democratic Party was a uh, leading banker who worked for J.P. Morgan. That was the synarchist. That was the enemy. Uh, I forget the guy's name. Uh, Beal or something like that. Um, there was an article about it. In uh, I think Tony Chaikin wrote something about six or eight months ago. Um, so, you know, Roosevelt within his own party had very difficult challenges. He had a handful of people who were really trusted collaborators. Harry Hopkins had worked for him in New York State when Roosevelt was governor, just before he was elected president. And so, you know, he was really one of his most reliable allies. In fact, Hopkins, uh, after his wife died, uh, lived at the White House with his daughter, with Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, they literally were in minute-to-minute, round-the-clock collaboration. But, you know, Roosevelt faced tremendous problems. Um, and, you know, very often brought people into his cabinet and into top government posts in order to keep his enemies even closer to him than he kept his friends so that they would have less latitude to sort of scheme behind his back. Um, and, you know, this included people like Averill Harriman, John J. McCloy. These were people from Wall Street who had financed Hitler. You know, Prescott Bush Sr., the grandfather of the current president, with Averill Harriman, poured the money into the Nazi party in 1933 to bail them out. They were about to go under. Um, so he had all of these factors to contend with. And furthermore, remember that, you know, Roosevelt was elected in 1932 and then was re-elected in 1936. And then coming into the period of the eruption of war in Europe, Roosevelt had a very difficult decision to make because ever since George Washington retired after his second term as president, nobody in American history had ever run for president three times. It was not a law. There was no constitutional amendment prohibiting it, but this was part of the American tradition. And Washington knew that there were many people at the time of the founding and at the time that we fought through and got the Constitution ratified who believed that uh, there was a danger that the president was too powerful and would eventually become the equivalent of a president for life or a king and that we would resort back to some kind of European-style monarchy. So George Washington made a very clear point of retiring from public life after his second term as president, to make the point clear that this was not to be an imperial office. So here it is, 1940. Europe is at war. Um, as the result of all sorts of internal dirty operations that were run against Roosevelt and the New Deal, the country went into an economic tailspin in 1937, shortly after Roosevelt's second re-election. Roosevelt had this guy named uh, Tex McCrary, I think his name was, from Texas, as his vice president, who was a total enemy of everything that Roosevelt stood for. And so, going into the war mobilization in 1940, Roosevelt has to make a very difficult decision. And he decides that he's going to run for a third term. Now, there was no question that he was going to win by a landslide and that the American people wanted him to run for such a third term. And in fact, the Republican candidate against him 
was a guy named Wendell Wilkie, who really actually, you know, was a supporter of most of Roosevelt's policies. Uh, Roosevelt dumped his vice president and brought in instead Henry Wallace to be his vice president in this critical period. Wallace was another one of these guys who was a political ally and somebody who came out of these Midwestern American system traditions. But this was a very big deal to break the historical precedent that went back to George Washington. And he did it because he knew that the country would not have made it because there was nobody else around who had the leadership qualities and the support of the American people that Roosevelt did. So he ran for re-election in 1940 and became the president who had a deal with Churchill and Stalin and all of the other world leaders during World War II. And then we came to 1944 and the war wasn't over. And Roosevelt was in terrible health. And he made a decision to run again because you still had this phenomenon that even the Democratic Party was a party that was largely dominated by J.P. Morgan and Wall Street interests that were hostile to the United States of the Founding Fathers. Now, by this point, the British oligarchy and the American financial oligarchy had concluded that Hitler had to be defeated. So they weren't debating that issue. They had put Hitler in power. They had helped finance Hitler. They were part of this international fascist, synarchist banking apparatus. But at the same time, they, reali they realized that uh, it was better to defeat Hitler and revive an Anglo-American empire after the war than to allow the triumph of fascism. Um, so Roosevelt ran for a fourth term in 1944, and there was a tremendous battle inside the Democratic Party. And among the thing, things that Roosevelt's enemies in the party insisted on is that Roosevelt had to dump Henry Wallace as his vice presidential running mate. Because by this point, everybody was anticipating that Roosevelt would die soon. And the person that they actually wanted to install as the running mate with FDR was a guy named Jimmy Burns, who was a complete Wall Street British agent. He wound up being the Secretary of State under Harry Truman. But Harry Truman was a sort of a compromise. He was just a small-minded, little clothing salesman from Independence, Missouri, who had found his way into politics through grassroots political machines and backroom deals. So Roosevelt was re-elected to a fourth term, an unprecedented fourth term, and at that election, Harry Truman was his running mate. And um, within a month after the re-inauguration, which was April 1945, from March 1945, Roosevelt was dead. He, you know, literally had, you know, worked himself to death by, you know, taking the view that um, the buck stopped with him. There was nobody else available to fill the role of president during this period of crisis. Now, you know, I mean, Lynn is not the president. And, you know, has basically indicated that, uh, you know, he wants to find somebody else to run as the Democratic nominee uh, in 2008, unless, you know, somebody really prevails on him to run. Um, but Lynn's influence within and upon the institution of the presidency is totally unprecedented and is of you know, almost equal significance to what Roosevelt was able to accomplish from the position of actually physically being the president. Lynn said a long time ago that, you know, there's two ways to um, control the presidency. The easy way is to have a real philosopher king as president. 
a real leader, a real Republican, a genius in the Oval Office. You know, that's happened in American history, I don't know, three or four times. You, you, you could probably say clearly that Washington was a genius, that Lincoln was a genius, that Roosevelt was a genius. Um, you know, everybody else, you'd be really hard-pressed. John Quincy Adams was a genius, but had a very difficult time as president. He was defeated in re-election by Andrew Jackson. Um, so we've gone through over 200 years of history with very, very few really great geniuses as presidents. We've had more than our share of mediocrity. Some of them, you know, probably could be qualified as outright traitors. We've had a lot of other people, you know, who generally have good intentions, uh, but had a lot of other flaws. So clearly there's more to the institution of the presidency than just the one guy. Because generally speaking, we've survived and prospered as a nation, uh, even given the you know, difficult times we're going through now, as we have many times in the past. So, you know, I think it's really important to understand that, you know, Lynn functions as a direct part of the institution of the presidency. This is not the kind of thing, you know, that you get, uh, you know, some kind of merit badge for and you can, you know, have an ID card in your wallet, you know, member of the institution of the presidency, but in a hell of a lot of other ways, you know, particularly uh, what the work that Lynn did on behalf of the president around the strategic defense initiative and other kinds of work that uh, Lynn did during the period of the Clinton presidency. He is, you know, considered to be a national treasure, particularly within this very, you know, a special institution in our government. The presidency has to function one way or the other, particularly during periods of crisis. We can muddle through times when things aren't all that, you know, uh, dangerous or stressful with mediocre presidents, but not the period that we're living in right now. We have to reconstruct the presidency uh, on the back of this moron, George W. Bush. And the only way to do that is to get Cheney out of the way, at which point um, we have to make sure that these ideas have been really fully adopted and grasped by leading people in the Congress, especially the Senate. That's something that's absolutely within our resources and capabilities to do. And that's why it's so important, and Lynn wants people to really, you know, grapple with this American system question and particularly really work through and discuss these eight, seven or eight points that Lynn has in this memo. If people have questions on that tonight, we could discuss through some of it. Yeah, Michelle? Yeah, at the very end of the memo, there's, um, we have two points of discussion. The mm -hmm. second one, where he brings up the factor of political ripeness. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering what um, in particular, because he, he describes how you can implement, you can go with certain policies now, but you have to wait for a, a, a certain like, m process of maturing, uh, maturity of the political process of political ripeness to be able to implement other aspects of it. But he doesn't say specifically what he's thinking of in in there. I was just wondering if you had any insights into what specifically um, there's a little bit more more latitude for what he says there's some <coughs> somewhat more latitude to to implement aspects of it. Well the biggie is if you go back and reread the whole memo, um, you know, Lynn starts out discussing uh, the uh, machine tool capacity 
embedded within the auto sector. And then he starts talking about other major infrastructure projects um, that uh, have to be implemented. He talks about some real revolutions in technology. You know, when he talks about going from a hydrogen-based fuel economy to uh, from a petroleum-based fuel economy, that's, you know, that's a real technological revolution, and it involves some technologies that are still only being worked on. You know, I mean, hydrogen cell batteries are clearly a major source of energy for the future, but we haven't gotten through all the glitches yet. There is no hydrogen cell battery that exists that actually, you know, can work on a kind of an industrial scale. Um, he talks about physical economic output, a return to fair trade rather than free trade. Um, and then he gets to the Lollapalooza, number five. This implies a set of emergency and continuing reforms of the international monetary financial system based on A, a return to an international fixed exchange rate, carefully regulated system. B, this means a reversal of a free trade policy back to a global fair trade policy consistent with low cost long term credit for physical capital improvements over spans of a quarter to a half a century, physical investment depreciation cycles in both domestic and foreign affairs. And then number seven, this is the other big shoe. Since nearly all leading national banking systems are currently bankrupt, and since the present international monetary financial system is hopelessly bankrupt under any attempted continuation of current policies, the crucial immediate issue is keeping essential banking institutions functioning even in a state of bankruptcy to such effect that the resolution of bankrupted institutions' honorable debts occurs over the span of some reasonable horizon and that worthless claims, such as financial derivative speculation, are debrided as uncollectible gambling debts. So, I mean, there, what he's basically saying is, and, and he emphasized this in discussions that we were having this morning. Um, this list of seven items, which he then you know, discusses in these two fashions afterwards, uh, are not like a Chinese menu <laughs> where you, know, you, pick, pick you pick your three favorites. <laughs> um, you can't do any of these things without doing the whole thing. You're not going to get the level of new credit injection into the economy if you continue to operate under the present Federal Reserve system, which is completely bankrupt, and with this unre unregulated derivatives hedge fund cancer running around. So, you know, what Lynn said is the toughest nut to crack in all of this is going to be putting the Federal Reserve system through government bankruptcy reorganization. And because he said these guys are not going to take that lying down. They're going to go absolutely nuts. What you're talking about here, this is the synergy. This is the international fascist banking apparatus that is going to not let go of power graciously. Their view is that they'll let a few paltry nation states continue to exist as powerless entities, almost kind of like, you know, historical throwbacks to a different time. But their idea is that they're moving for a global financial dictatorship. So this is going to be the head-to-head -head fight. I don't think George Bush is in that fight with us. So, you know, I think what Lynn is saying is right now, the most critical thing, which is doable under these circumstances, is let's make sure that we don't allow this machine tool factor within the auto sector to go down the tubes. We can get certain things going right now before we deal with Mr. Bernanke and the whole Fed and all of the offshore derivatives and all of that. Um, that issue is going to come on the table uh, by force of circumstances. Something is going to happen that is going to be the trigger for a big systemic crisis and at that point that issue is going to be forced on the table. But certain things can be done before that. We can make sure that, 
you know, I mean, look, there's legislation pending right now. It's very interesting what's already been happening inside the Senate as the result of our having broken the vice grip of control of Cheney and company. You know, you had, who would have thought that, that, that Senator Frank Lautenberg from New Jersey and <laughs> Senator Trent Lott from Mississippi would team up to introduce a pretty good piece of legislation to create a bonding authority for high-speed rail construction, high-speed passenger rail. Um, so things are happening. Hillary Clinton is doing certain things on this auto caucus. Um, and because now even in the House of Representatives, as the result of Cheney's psychotic episode against Congressman Murtha, um, Cheney has lost control over the House of Representatives. By and large, Cheney Republicans in the House of Representatives are the guys that are about to be carted off to jail around this whole Jack Abramoff case. So there are things that are going to change dramatically, and I think what Lynn's saying is, is that you know, you've got to have a clear sense of the totality of what you're going to do and realize that you can't do it only halfway. But you can get certain things going right now that don't meet the full criterion of a new Bretton Woods system and, you know, a full-scale launching of a global economic program for recovery. But you can get certain things done immediately. And people within the domain even of the existing legislative agenda in the Congress are pushing some of these things. These are prototypes for what needs to be done. You know, the $50 billion that Lautenberg and Lott are proposing to allocate for a program to, you know, modernize high-speed rail is a drop in the bucket. We're talking about trillions of dollars in new long-term credits being emitted into the economy. But nevertheless, these are very good steps. We want to push the envelope on these things and make sure they happen right away. And by dealing with the Cheney problem, you can create the circumstances where Bush would not dare to veto legislation coming through the Congress, putting some of these projects forward. And, you know, we also are going to explore very rapidly what the full implications are of Bill Ford making this highly uncharacteristic uh, speech. This is the kind of thing that people in the auto industry you know, management people used to give these kinds of speeches at the Detroit Economics Club 30 years ago. But this is generally not what they talk about now. They talk about General Motors' wonderful expanding real estate portfolio and their plans to outsource more and more auto production offshore and how General Motors is going to survive. Why? Because they've got the biggest toehold of any U.S. auto company in China. So this was a breath of fresh air. And it obviously reflects a certain early phases of a shift in thinking, a paradigm shift in thinking. So we're going to drive these things through and look for every flank and every opportunity to actually get some of these things done. Because, look, if you turn around this auto situation, even by getting a certain amount of productive capacity being you know, retooled for some of these other infrastructure projects. A number of things are going to happen. Number one, uh, it's going to be a significant measure of Lynn's actual political muscle, not influence, but outright political muscle in this country to have pulled this off against all odds. And number two, it will serve to create a certain kind of remoralization among segments of the population that are right now quite demoralized except when we get our hands on them and give them a few moments of optimism. So those are the kinds of things, the piecemeal things that will actually have dramatic consequences. It's like one of the questions that came up from a member of Congress, you know, who said, well, okay, let's say we do get rid of Cheney, but what about Rumsfeld and what about this and what about that? Is it really enough just to get rid of Cheney? And Lynn, you know, made this point. Don't think mechanistically. Think dynamically. What process gets set in motion? What phase shift in the whole situation occurs if you dump Cheney? Who's going to be identified as the guy who did it? 
you know, and what are going to be the implications for the Democratic Party and for bipartisanship with Republicans if we deliver Dick Cheney's bald scalp? <laughs> So, you know, these things, the dynamic implications of them are far different. If you told somebody, okay, Cheney goes, come up with a mechanical list of all of the things that will be different as the result of that, they'd probably come up with a list of one thing, which is that, you know, well, Bush is going to pick somebody to replace him, and the Senate is going to have a confirmation hearing, and there'll be a new guy on the job. End of story. But from the standpoint of... The world that we're living in, the political dynamic of change that that would represent, it's a whole different thing. Yeah, because what you were just saying about the, well, this thing about ending globalization, it's fine to have like, an infrastructure program, but unless you talk about getting rid of the financial system, you're, it's not going to work. Yeah. But the way he answered that question, was he, he started talking about George Shultz. And so if Cheney goes, and people see that it was someone like Schultz who was running this whole border policy, you know. Exactly. This whole thing. Then there could be like this whole revolution against Wall Street. Yeah, exactly. 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 And that's what's, you know, that's what's, that's what's ultimately going to happen. And, you know, by the way, Lynn is going to be, uh, we're having the next Berlin conference coming up in uh, a little over a week. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's actually a week from this coming Tuesday. And, uh, you know, you just think about, especially some of our leading European and Russian uh, collaborators who are going to be now coming to a third Berlin conference in the course of about a year. So the first one was the middle of January of this year. And then we had the follow-on in June. And now... We're going to have this in, in early December. And you just think about the political transformation of the United States from a year ago when, you know, in December of 2004, we were just sort of, you know, coming out of the shell shock of the November elections. And you look at what's happened. You know, the political transformation in Washington, the, you know, political growth, of the apparatus that's turning to Lynn for leadership. And, you know, the impact that that's going to have on these people in Europe and Russia and other places is going to be really dramatic. You know, it's not at all a coincidence that the Chinese government decided to wait until about, you know, 30 seconds after Bush's Air Force One plane was in the air leaving China that they posted... Lynn's interview, which he did some, sometime like last June, uh, on the website of People's Daily. So, you know, they chose to do this at a strategic moment, knowing that, you know, everybody in the Bush White House was going to be looking to see what coverage there was in China of Bush's trip. And the first thing they see on People's Daily, the official government, you know, news organization and website, is this mammoth, you know, interview with Lynn. I mean, we, we figured out that if we publish the whole thing in EIR, it'll be 16 pages. Yeah. So this is not some, you know, little 30-second <coughs> soundbite type thing. Joanne, you had a question? No, I was just going to say before, with this question of the, um, the political ripeness, because I remember when I was working on some of the FBI stuff, uh, Lynn had mentioned in one of his speeches how um, like at the point in for FDR that the the real economic reorganization mobilization didn't come until the, the threat of the war because the mindset of the population wasn't there in terms of the you know just a, a real necessity to make these these breakthroughs and the you know the innovations and things. But what I was thinking of is that it almost seems like it's it's reversed because like now we're talking about you know the question of the reconstruction kind of first, and the fact that in order to do that, you need the, the monetary changes, whereas with Roosevelt, when he first came in, the system was already bankrupt. And then it was a question of, you know, shifting the mindset for the, the economic reconstruction. So, uh, well, it's the same thing with these labor guys, because um, I remember organizing Detroit three years ago, 
you go to a UAW event, you know, you might as well be spit in the face by these guys, because these guys treated you like complete <laughs> shit. They didn't respect you whatsoever, at least to your face, anyway. I mean, you had some people that were kind of like underground LaRouche supporters or whatever, closet LaRouches. But um, I've noticed that some of these people, like this guy Rex from Missouri, I think he's from Missouri, he's been the last two lobbying uh, days of action with us. And the second go around, oh, and some of them are becoming a really m much more reflective on this free trade question. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> Because now he's beginning to really become more subconscious of the difference of how, what makes these aides uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And he brought up to us, he said, man, you know, as soon as you guys start talking about free trade, this girl, just she didn't want to talk to you. She mm -hmm. didn't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so he's seeing the difference between going and talking about, because then we had a discussion about talking about single issues, like begging for a piece of the pie, versus actually mm -hmm. going after and uprooting what these guys don't want to talk about. Because uh, it's a lot of these union guys, they still don't really understand the American system, even though they do. It's kind of strange. Like, they don't... Kind of ingrained. They don't know it do. formally, yeah. but they know they know it because of what they're involved in. But just because the, I think things have gotten so bad uh, in, in the labor that they're more willing to really reevaluate this question of the difference between free trade and fair trade. Because they, they tend to, like, use it interchangeably in a lot of instances. So the tendency is to want to know this stuff. So I, I really, because they're really educating us on a lot of the stuff they know, but we're really educating them on what is the American system. And they're starting to pick this stuff up really quickly. And so you're starting to see this leadership layer growing amongst the labor unions just because of working with us and these lobbying things. It's uh, are, are a lot of these guys going to be coming back? Is it <laughs> we're going to have a bigger delegation, mm -hmm. hopefully? I would <laughs> be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's certainly the intent. <laughs> yeah. But I think it might be interesting. Do you know who the guy was, the suggestion box thing? Because I think it would be a very useful pedagogy to actually do some sort of write-up on it, to actually look at. Because, you know, he's saying that, you know, the original, I think it was like some sort of, drill bit thing, I don't exactly know yeah. what his function was, but he said the original one was like, a, a, you know, it, it involved five pieces, and it was $550 for them to, in, you know, bring it in, but then they designed a three-piece one that cost $50 to produce. So I just think that, you know, as a pedagogy, it'd be really interesting to, to develop it further. For yeah, absolutely. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, Lynn wants us to just, you know, do an enormous amount of outreach. I mean, you know, we're smart, but you know we don't have 30 years experience, you know, working in a machine tool shop. Mm -hmm. At least I don't see anybody in the room here who I recall. So I mean, we have to draw on a lot of people who who know how this stuff works. We've got to have it's, it's exactly what Heather was saying. We've got a certain thing that we've got to put on the table. We've got to give them a framework, and we've got to give them a sense of a political operation that gives them reason to be optimistic that this thing is going to happen. And, you know, when we started talking to these guys in the spring about, you know, how this, you know, could they retool these plants? And they started, you know, talking about, ex they know exactly how this stuff works. And they explained to us stuff that, you know, I mean, it could take you a lifetime to learn. But, you know, this knowledge was really not going to very important use until, you know, we put this whole thing together. And, you know, I mean, it's not self-evident uh, how you put together this kind of, you know, national economic recovery plan. Because, you know, let, let's say you started out by looking at this idea of a combination of high-speed rail and, you know, at least in some key areas, magnetic levitation. So you say, okay, we're going to do transportation and we're going to figure out what it takes to, you know, go with, with that plan that was in the latest or I guess one issue back of 21st century, 42,000 miles of, you know, high speed commuter rail around the United States. And when you start adding up how much steel is required and then you start thinking about how much energy is required to build 
and then, you know, run those steel plants. How much water is involved in these kinds of major industrial facilities? Um, you really are operating on a very complex domain of national economic planning. So on the one hand, you've got to have a national plan. On the other hand, Lynn emphasized in the webcast and in, in the discussion afterwards that um, you've got to be very attentive to the idea that you can't only <coughs> earmark or select certain areas of the country for these projects. He said, you know, basically every county in the United States, I don't remember the exact number, but I think it may be somewhere around 5,000 total counties in the United States. Uh, every county needs to have some kind of genuine source of productive revenue. You know, in rural areas, it's going to be agriculture and, you know, light industry associated with agriculture. In other areas, you know, it may be something completely different. It could be heavy manufacturing. It could be, you know, energy generation. It could be other things. But, you know, basically, when you're talking about uh, maintaining a national economy, you have to really be attentive to the fact that, you know, most people live in a relatively confined geographic area, and you've got to make sure that there's prosperity in all of those areas. If you're going to have decent schools, if you're going to have decent roads, if you're going to have public hospitals that actually provide care for everybody, these are county revenues. And it's not going to operate on the basis of a real estate bubble. You're going to have to go back to having actual productive work in every part of the country. So, you know, these are very, you know, challenging issues. They're exciting issues to, you know, put all of this stuff together. But what Lynn said is we've got to be working with Congress on having at least a vision of a master plan and some sort of strategy of what do you do first. You can't have magnetic levitation trains if you haven't first rebuilt the steel industry. That's why Lynn says we're looking at something that's going to take 25 to 50 years to pull off at best. But it's definitely the way to go. Yeah, and that's um, that's definitely a little bit more of a concept that's understandable, at least for me personally, in terms of you know having these case studies like the you know what FDR did look at and kind of expect the unexpected, like three times what you thought you were going to be able to produce when you set a bar first. So my question will be more of a question from political strategy. Um, for example, in the NEC meeting that you guys had the other day, that was transcribed in the briefing. Debbie made the suggestion to do something before now and before the year was up. Yeah. And I remember that after that, I know that I wasn't quite clear on what the difference was because Lynn's response was, well, we want to make sure we don't want to get a false start on this thing. And then you kind of mentioned something <coughs> earlier just a second ago about making sure that, you know, we don't, that we're kind of waiting on something to happen or some something to transpire. And I'm not quite cl clear on not exactly what it is, because I'm sure we don't know, but what I'm saying is I'm a little bit even cloudy on how to ga how Lynn's gauging or and how you guys just in general are gauging the political terrain and the political curvature, if you will, of the situation. So if you could say something a little bit about that. Sure. Um, we had a discussion on, um, on Monday night. Uh, most of the uh, youth had gotten back out to Detroit. So we had a discussion for a couple hours on Monday night, and there were all sorts of ideas on the table. And, um, you know, one person suggested maybe having some people come in from some other regions and do like a real big week of action in the Midwest, you know, during the period that Washington was sort of, you know, out of session, Congress was out of session. And, um, you know, the point that I made, and I think it was similar to the point that Lynn made in response to Debbie's question. Because um, remember, she had said, should we have a week of action before the week during the January 11th webcast? And Lynn said, no, but be prepared because, you know, things could blow up. And what I said to the youth in the Midwest is, look, General Motors just announced 30,000 layoffs, which <coughs> means 
shutting down either altogether or shutting down for the most part a whole bunch of major production facilities all over Michigan, Ohio, and up into Canada and Toronto. Why don't you guys map out, you know, literally look on a map and see where those plants are and look at the communities that are going to be affected by that and, you know, anticipate that there's going to be something big and explosive happening. We don't know exactly what form it's going to take, but we know it's going to happen. So let's deploy generally into the situation without over committing to one idea or another. Because, you know, what if we decided that we were going to have a week of action in Lansing, Michigan, and, you know, there was some massive development that took place in Columbus? Um, I think the situation, and what Lynn said, is just start organizing right now for the January 11th webcast. Be in a state of mobilization. Things are going to be breaking very, very quickly in a lot of unpredictable ways. I mean, you know... On Thursday of last week, the uh, big thing was that we had, you know, pulled off with uh, Mark Sweezy and his whole crew from Columbus, you know, a really effective lobbying day on Capitol Hill that was reverberating all over the place. It was clearly, you know, the single most dramatic and effective day of intervention that, you know, we've probably ever had in Washington up on Capitol Hill. Who would have expected that the very next day, as the result of Cheney being left home alone to do something really stupid, did it, and triggered this explosive debate in the House of Representatives, which then changed everything. And, you know, to his credit, Steve Douglas immediately, after that Mirtha business on Friday, sent a bunch of field squads into Murtha's district in Pennsylvania and just simply, you know, intersected a tremendous amount of political ferment. If we had planned out a deployment into Murtha's district separate from the events that occurred in the House on Friday, you know, it would have been a good deployment, but it would have not been this sort of explosive breakout so, you know, I think what Lynn's generally saying is we're in a state of absolute mobilization because we have to build up momentum going into Congress's full return for the next year of business on January 9th. And we've got to just be prepared to move in any direction as fast as possible because so many things in the strategic situation have reached a threshold where um, any one of these issues on any given day could completely, you know, blow up. You just do a kind of a timeline or, you know, chronology of the last three or four weeks and, you know, you just see an extraordinary series of events. October 28th is less than a month ago and that's the day that Lewis Libby was indicted and forced to resign the next day. That was a big event that changed the entire internal political dynamic in the White House in ways that are still playing out. Now, you know, we know in general that there's going to be a whole bunch of new indictments probably hitting the whole top Republican radical right-wing leadership in the House of Representatives. Tom DeLay, Roy Blunt, this guy Ney up in Ohio. A whole bunch of people are likely to be indicted. They've already been told that they're going to be indicted. And these guys were told, um, you have a choice. The statute of limitation on the crime we want to indict you on expires tomorrow. Uh, you can either give us a waiver so that the, you, you waive the statute of limitation or we'll indict you today. And that's what happened with these congressmen. So, you know, whether it's the Bill Ford completely out of the blue uh, speech here in Washington signaling a shift in thinking among, you know, the handful of sane executives left in the auto sector, or whether it's going to be some dramatic development in Iraq, or Lynn Cheney taking a baseball bat to her husband's head. You know, I mean, we're just in, we're living through a period where on almost any given day, 
the expectation should be a dramatic phase shift event occurring. It won't happen every day, but you know it's it's definitely the right frame of mind to be in, to expect it. And I think the general directionality is uh, towards an explosive shakeup at the White House of some kind or other. I mean, Bush has three choices. He can do a complete house cleaning, get rid of Cheney and others, and you know, bring in a whole new team, and you know, basically submit himself to a vastly improved daycare center adult supervision. Or he can, you know, ignore reality and just keep doing what he's doing, in which case he's going to collapse, you know, his polls will go into negative numbers. <laughs> or he can try something sort of halfway in between, go on television and say, we all make mistakes, I apologize, but I'm keeping my team, which, you know, won't help him out very much. But something is going to happen on the White House front. Now you've got momentum on something dramatic happening uh, with the Iraq situation. Um, there are people who are still sitting on enormous amounts of additional scandal material that could bring down Cheney, you know, with some big explosive scandal at any moment. Any one of these things is going to qualitatively change the situation. And the good thing is that almost any of these things happening is going to improve our position. So the, the thing we've got to keep doing is making sure that we're moving forward. There's certain things that are absolutely clear, which is that we have these two focal points of intervention, and we should start mobilizing people right now to get ready for this January 11th webcast. It's become a tradition in Washington that when Congress comes back into session in the first few days, Lynn is there giving marching orders and defining the policy framework in which the government is going to function. So people need to know that now. And, you know, we've got to make sure that we're doing a hell of a lot of work, really preparing to take this FDR Hopkins message fully into the Democratic Party. That's going to take, you know, a lot of work as well. But, you know, the, w the way we work things with Lynn, I mean, you know, Lynn is in Europe now. He went over there uh, a couple of days ago for the Berlin conference. So um, in some respects, uh, the schedule is that a bunch of us get on the phone with Lynn 8 o'clock in the morning and, you know, catch him up on things that occurred after he already went to sleep the night before. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're sort of on a uh, early morning schedule to have a real picture pulled together for a strategic discussion with Lynn so that, you know, by the time people come into the office and are ready for, you know, the morning briefing, the, you know, the 915 conference call, you know, Jerry's briefing and things like that, you know, the whole organization is going to be keying off of marching orders that are just moments old from Lynn. So, you know, I think that's going to be a real driver during this period. And, you know, everything that's breaking, we're discussing continuously back and forth with Lynn. And, you know, he really insisted on that because, you know, we've got a situation where with the modern technology of, you know, laptop computers and cell phones and, you know, blueberries and strawberries and all of these <laughs> other technologies, um, you know, yeah, dingleberries, that's, a, that's an old technology. <laughs> um, if Lynn wants to mobilize the organization on something, we can do it within a, within a matter of moments. We can, you know, get to everybody here in Washington and be, you know, completely shifting gears. And, you know, I can tell you, as these breaking developments are occurring, unpredictable in terms of what's going to happen today versus tomorrow, but directionality, we know where it's going to go. Um, more and more people are going to be and are demanding to know instantaneously what is Lynn's evaluation, what does he want them to do. Yeah? Would you, would you say that this is, or it seems like there's just almost so many things that are, that are breaking like from day to day that we're almost like picking and choosing which ones would be like the most efficient flanks to go after. Exactly. As opposed to like a couple of years ago when we were kind of making the interventions and kind of 
imposing the flanks on the political situation, like for example with the Children of Satan series or something. And I don't know, could you just say something about like the difference? It seems like those types of things, those types of initiatives from a few years ago, and way further before I was, was even born and all this stuff, is kind of leading to the situation where you have now where just like the whole thing's falling. So I mean like in terms of like the, the different types of approaches that you have to the political situation strategizing differently, like what's, how is it? Well, I think b because we, we are reaching a boundary condition. We're reaching a boundary condition on the global financial system. And, you know, you, again, you can't predict precisely what is going to be the triggering event or events, but you know that you're getting closer and closer to a point where this whole thing can't go on. So, and, you know, we're also in a situation where one of the most important changes is, in fact, the uh, dramatic increase in the political power of Lynn and Lynn's ideas, and particularly the role of, of the youth movement as a kind of a political driver. You know, Lynn, I, I've been in a bunch of meetings just before Lynn went over to Europe, uh, in which, you know, Lynn was meeting with some people from, you know, fairly important government institutions. And, you know, Lynn's message across the board was, we're living in revolutionary times. This is not, you know, business as usual. It's not, you know, sort of picking and choosing and waiting and, you know, trying to invent flanks. This is a period where things really are moving extraordinarily rapidly. You could see the presidency crumble. You could see, you know, two of the industrial giants of the American economy for the last hundred years, General Motors and Ford, go under. You know, these are the kinds of, you know, really dramatic events that force people to transform the way they think. You know, we've been living for the last 30 years in a culture that's completely insane and degenerate and which doesn't function, that within that culture, you can't derive any solutions that are going to solve the problems of today. I mean, you know, we're living in the culture of globalization and free trade. You can't solve any of the economic problems by sticking with globalization and free trade. You know, you can't have a consumer-driven economy and begin to revive and rebuild production. You know, this is one of these moments where either you have a revolutionary transformation or you're going to go into a dark age. So it happens happily in this country that when you're talking about a revolutionary transformation, you're talking about a reinvigorating of the revolutionary principles on which the country was founded. We don't need to go looking around or shopping for some new form of government or, you know, some new, more effective political institutions. We have the best that exist. We have to just simply make sure that they work again because they've fallen into terrible disrepair. So, you know, these, these cultural issues uh, are really what's, you know, <coughs> being challenged, the axiomatic assumptions on which policy was made by policy makers, the axiomatic assumptions under which people lived their daily lives are no longer functioning. And so that's one of the things that's really different. And it's coming to a head. And, you know, here in Washington, D.C., you know, you're in an environment that is defined by policy making. I mean, that's what this town does. If you care to look around, there's not a lot of factories. You know, it's not like the Industrial Revolution um, ever arrived in Washington, D.C. This place was set up on a swamp to be the headquarters of the federal government. And virtually everything else that happens around town has something or other to do with that. So, 
the process of change here in Washington is much more palpable. It's much more in the air. And you can have different kinds of conversations with people, you know, up on the hill, on the university campuses, uh, than you were having six months or a year ago. Because there wasn't this sense of immediacy. It's exactly what Percy Shelley wrote about in In Defense of Poetry. That you reach certain revolutionary moments where suddenly ideas matter. And the, the consequences of going with one set of ideas versus another set of ideas are very profound and at the same time they're very immediate and sensuous. So, you know, that, that's, that's where we are. And our job is to make sure that we don't flinch and don't, you know, hold back from fully taking advantage of the fact that we do have a certain, you know, understanding of where this thing is headed. You know, most people in Congress, I mean, this is going to be a very good week to visit with some of our friends on Capitol Hill because they don't have these nudnik congressmen running around bothering them constantly for all sorts of nitnoy things. I mean, if you look at the, at the amount of useless legislation and time-wasting hearings that take place on Capitol Hill, and compare that to 100 years or 150 years ago, you'll see that you know somebody created a kind of a cocoon in which congressmen and senators are kept continuously wrapped up in little things to where it's very hard for them to break out and actually <coughs> think about the big issues of governing the country and running the world. So that's starting to break down. We're going in and we're having conversations with people and they're not telling us, what does this have to do with my committee assignment? <laughs> you know, I mean, even a few months ago, you used to hear that all the time. You know, among people who are very smart and who, you know, read and, you know, better than most grasp Lynn's writings and policies. They would say, you know, but I'm preoccupied. My job is, you know, to do little things. I mean, how ironic. Here you are in the capital of the most powerful nation in history, and your job is to legislate, and you're complaining that you're caught up in little things and can't get to the big stuff. Well, if you ain't doing it, nobody is. It's yeah. certainly not being done at the White House. We have people going in who's on the committee for reality in this office. Yeah, exactly. exactly. That's exactly it. So, <laughs> I'm not, I don't think I'm going to ask this, but um, do you know, like, to what extent, or this thing around you, you brought up in a brief another day about the economic animations, how, how is that going to proceed, and what aspects of the economy does Lynn want studies of, to do animations of, or... Um, well, I think the general idea is to um, sort of rotate a lot of people from the youth movement uh, into Leesburg for a couple of weeks at a time, probably, you know, groups of two or three, to work closely with John Hofel. And uh, we're, we're in the process of actually right now setting up uh, another computer, duplicating what J John has on his computer, both the software and the data. And I think Lynn's idea is to just get, you know, people in the youth movement immersed in the ongoing work on the animations with the idea that, you know, we're in different parts of the country. And, you know, we're going to see things going on there that we're going to want to explore and, you know, develop, you know, the, the material on. Um, right now, I think, you know, Lynn doesn't particularly have a uh, set of specific priorities. He just wants more work done, more overall volume. He wants a lot more of the animation work to be available for the websites and for the work in Congress because it's the most effective way to force people to actually think in terms of physical economy rather than money. When you show people the collapse of steel production, 
of machine tool production, the collapse of the rail infrastructure, and all of these things, and they actually can you know physically see it right in front of their eyes, the incredible shrinking U.S. economy, um, it has a different kind of impact. It, 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 it enables people to conceptualize things. So I think the idea is to just start rotating people in and you know see where it goes. Right now, there's more work to be done than John can conceivably do. And therefore, the idea is that there's people who've got some computer skills who have you know, really been doing a lot of the work on the economic mapping and work with the animations. Just start rotating people through and you know, just um, see where it goes. It's, it's one of these things where, where, where there's, you know, it's absolutely clear that this is uh, a very viable project to launch at this point without any kind of, you know, final objective or, you know, precise goals of what's going to come out of it. Just get more and more people playing with the stuff and all sorts of really good ideas will materialize out of it. So I know that, you know, John, I think, was talking with Lynn and with uh, Phil and Harley and they were going to come up with some sort of plan for, you know, getting people, probably some from the East Coast and, you know, maybe one or two from California rotating in right away. I think we want to get it started within the next week or so. So. When is this Harry Hopkins piece going to be completed? Or is there going to be like some uh, some compilation of, of a package looking at what he did uh, and, and comparing it to what types of things that need to be done? Yeah, we're going to brief Lynn on this meeting we had this afternoon tomorrow morning and discuss basically trying to get we'll get something written this week for the EIR. But I'll tell you that you know there, there's a lot more work that can and should be done on this. Not, we're not going to hold up writing something for the publication. But, um, you know, the history of the Roosevelt administration is one of the best kept and, you know, buried secrets <laughs> imaginable. Um, that uh, long, probably slightly too long article that Richie Freeman wrote for the uh, end of an illusion, end of a delusion pamphlet um, back, I guess, a year or so, a couple of years ago, um, represented the fruits of a couple of years of research because, you know, going to the Library of Congress, going up to Hyde Park, New York, where FDR <coughs> lived and where all of his presidential papers are, uh, so much stuff was destroyed willfully so that the actual history of how the economy grew and prospered under Roosevelt is not known. He had to go back and reconstruct data from, you know, raw files from the National Archives from the 1930s and 40s. And what, what we've got is, you know, probably as of now, one of the most detailed accounts of this aspect of the Roosevelt presidency. So there's a lot more work to be done. There's a lot of reading to do. People should, you know, really feel free to jump in on it. But we'll get something produced this week that will, you know, give people a kind of basic outline of it. And also uh, we'll try to come up with some sort of bibliography for people who want to do some work on this. I know there's a book called Roosevelt and Hopkins. Do you? Hmm. By, uh, by Sherwood? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, it doesn't have much on this whole 1930s period. It has two chapters called pre-1941, and then the rest of the book is really about the war mobilization. It's not. It's it's good. It's it's certainly worth reading. But um, in terms of reconstructing what happened during this critical or early period, I we got we have to come up with a reading list and you know get people access to some of the stuff. Yeah, the other book I started reading was. Um the one, I guess there's two books, I think, by Roosevelt himself, isn't it? Hey, uh, it's <coughs> the one I was reading, I think Mike has it as well, is the One Hour Way, yeah. where mm -hmm. he's kind of told you, you know, from his perspective, what the first, I guess it's the first hundred days of the steps that they took and what was going on behind the scenes, which is mm -hmm. amazing. One interesting thing that I wanted to read, I don't have a copy of yet, is the, uh, is his, um, his graduate dissertation mm -hmm. from Harvard. Yeah, I was trying to look for that a while. Um, yeah, I mean, I know, I, I saw that um, 
in the uh, in the uh, Richie Freeman thing that there's a few photocopy pages from it. So I assume that somewhere up at Hyde Park maybe it's available, or maybe it's you know maybe by now it's online. I don't know. You know. Maybe yeah, maybe on file at Harvard. Yeah. Maybe on file at Harvard. It yeah, probably it's is, published yeah. Because when you do a thesis or a doctoral thing, it's a published work from the university. So you know what it's well, called? Uh, title? No, it's but I think it's in the it's, it's in the article, yeah. You guys have some friends in Boston. Yeah. yeah. So brush up against a little bit in Henry Lewis's uh, autobiography somebody did, I mean biography somebody autobiography somebody did on Henry Lewis the uh, Henry Lewis's empire some of the negative aspects of the Democratic Party organizing against Roosevelt oh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I came across an article in some of the TCF work a few years ago mm-hmm. There's another very useful book that sort of gives you a real sense of the Roosevelt's enemies which is called All Honorable Men mm-hmm. by this guy John Stuart Martin it's, it's hard to find um I have a Xerox copy of it, and if anybody has a library card from Georgetown, they have it there. Isn't there a movie made from that, All Honorable Men? Uh, it, I, a, a movie with that title, but not from this book. Oh, really? There's some, yeah. some, 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 <coughs> some of the, uh, I was speaking of contribution from a guy, and he started going on about that. Mm-hmm. Get the book, All Honorable Men, and read it, and then there was some movie that was created. Oh, maybe there was, I don't know. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, Jack Nicholson. I have no idea. <laughs> I was going to ask how, how close you <laughs> yeah, that's definitely that's a different that's a different script than the book I'm talking about. <laughs> anyway, I got to go do the briefing tomorrow morning, so <laughs> to be continued. <laughs> I don't know. I think I think he's ma- I think he's mainly working on jet lag right now. Well, they're asking Deerslade came off the jet lag. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I'm just getting caught up now. <laughs> we don't have an EIR this coming. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's going to have the board stuff. Yeah, the one we're, we're going to do an EIR this coming week that'll come out the following week. Yeah. But maybe we should get you to get a copy for the office. Jeff, yeah, but, and like some, uh, some of these lyrics yeah, are a little bit more interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Look at the last song. You like it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, tomorrow?